Thank you, Annabelle and team, for leading us in a time of worship through songs. And now we look at God's Word in our worship unto Him through the reflection of our hearts upon His Word. So we continue today in our sermon series on Nehemiah from the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. And we'll be looking at chapter 7, A Servant's Conviction. What has happened so far is that in spite of numerous oppositions and obstacles, Nehemiah and his team, who have been building the wall, have now completed the wall. And Nehemiah now begins to shift focus from rebuilding the wall to now rebuilding the community. From rebuilding the wall to now rebuilding the community. And it is the godly convictions that he stands by, a servant's godly convictions, that enables him to rebuild the community according to God's will. And so that's what we'll be looking at today. How a servant's godly convictions enables him to fulfill God's will. In the case of Nehemiah, God's will to rebuild the community. Let me say that again. A servant's godly convictions enables him to fulfill God's will. There are 73 verses in Nehemiah chapter 7, and we will not read all 73 verses, but only the first five verses of the chapter. And so let me read it for us, Nehemiah chapter 7, verses 1 to 5. After the wall had been rebuilt and I had set the doors in place, the gatekeepers, the musicians, and the Levites were appointed. I put in charge of Jerusalem my brother Hanani, along with Hananiah, the commander of the citadel, because he was a man of integrity and feared God more than most people do. I said to them, The gates of Jerusalem are not to be opened until the sun is hot. While the gatekeepers are still on duty, have them shut the doors and bar them. Also, appoint residents of Jerusalem as guards, some at their posts and some near their houses. Now the city was large and spacious, but there were few people in it, and the houses had not yet been rebuilt. So my God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles, the officials, and the common people for registration by families. I found the genealogical record, record of those who had been the first to return. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God indeed. Slightly more than 80 years ago, a society was facing an enemy of seemingly overwhelming force and might. And they were on the brink of hopelessness when a man of conviction led them with fortitude and gave them the strength to fight on and ultimately claim victory over their enemy. Winston Churchill was the World War II Prime Minister of Britain. And they were facing up to the great army of the German Nazis that had overrun, that had overrun, much, that had overrun much of Europe. And he famously issued these ending words in his 1941 speech. He said, Never give in. Never give in. Never, 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 never give in. Except to convictions of honour and good sense. He also told the nation that we shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets, we shall fight in the hills, we shall never surrender. It was Winston Churchill's conviction that Britain would not fall to the German Nazis that ultimately galvanised his people and rebuilt their confidence. Nehemiah too held on to some convictions. We have already seen from the early chapters that Nehemiah was a man who knows God intimately. He knows God's word and is a man of prayer. It is therefore no surprise to us that he would hold on to some convictions about God and how God's people should live. 
And today we will look at three godly convictions that Nehemiah lives by. They enabled him to rebuild the community in according to God's will. Firstly, Nehemiah was convicted that the relationship with God was of first priority. Nehemiah was convicted that the relationship with God was of first priority. And we see that right from the very first verse of chapter 7. After the wall had been rebuilt and I had set the doors in place, the gatekeepers, the musicians and the Levites were appointed. After the wall had been rebuilt, Nehemiah had set the doors in place, the gatekeepers were appointed to guard those doors and guard those gates. And there were probably many other things that Nehemiah could quickly have put in place thereafter for people to begin to do well in the city. He could have done many things. For example, I can imagine a city centre, a town hall, perhaps a marketplace to be put in place so that the people can trade. And these are pretty important, isn't it? To be put in place for a community to flourish in a way they live their lives in the city. I was looking at the photos of our Topayo town in the 1960s. And this is what uh, happened. The housing was put in place and then the city centre and the market came next so that people could gather, they could, uh, have, uh, they could eat, they could buy, they could do things together. No one thought that the most important thing to do was to put a church in the town until Pastor Michael came along and did exactly that. But that was what Nehemiah did. The first thing that Nehemiah did after the gate and the gatekeepers were put in place was to appoint the musicians and the Levites. The musicians signified the worship of God and the Levites signified God's law. Nehemiah was making sure that the first priority of how they lived their lives as a community was the centrality of worship and God's law in their midst. Nehemiah was convicted that their relationship with God is of the greatest importance and priority. Raymond Brown, the Old Testament scholar, notes that and I quote, their greatest priority was to ensure that God was at the heart of their personal, local, and national life. End quote. To Nehemiah, that was of the most, of the foremost priority. And everything else in their lives flows from that. It is from their relationship with God as first priority that everything else in their lives is established thereafter. And I believe there is a lesson for us from here, from Nehemiah's foremost conviction for us today, that relationship with God must come first. Do we give God, do we give our relationship with God our first priority? When we, when we wake up in the morning, <clears throat> what is the first thought of the day? Do we immediately check our handphones, look at the latest news, check our emails and WhatsApp messages, something that I am guilty of. This morning, the first thing that I did was to check whether Liverpool won or not last night. Or do we check in with God, say a short prayer to commit our day to the Lord, allowing God to direct how our day goes? Letting our relationship with God establish what follows in the way, uh, follows in the way we live our day and how we make our decisions for the day. Do we allow God to dictate our day right from the start of the day? And perhaps for the longer term plans for our lives other than our day to day living, how do we think about how we make decisions for the longer term plans of our lives? whether for our families or for our careers? What is our foremost consideration in how we make decisions? Do we seek God first for His will above all else? Or are other factors like money, paycheck, status, or perhaps even work-life balance, are these our first priority instead in how we make our decisions in life? 
do we give our relationship with God our first priority and allow Him to dictate all else that happens in our lives? What was Nehemiah's conviction? That God must be their first priority in the way they order their lives. And I pray that we too have that conviction that we must live our lives with our relationship with God being our first and foremost priority. Secondly, Nehemiah was convicted of the need to put godly people in charge. Nehemiah was convicted of the need to put godly people in charge. In verse 2, we read, I put in charge of Jerusalem, that is the whole city, Jerusalem, my brother Hanani, along with Hananiah, the commander of the citadel, because he was a man of integrity and feared God more than most people do. We have already met Hanani before. Hanani was uh, Nehemiah's brother, who we first read of in chapter 1. He was the one who brought news of the sad state of Jerusalem to Nehemiah. No doubt, he had also been burdened by what was happening in Jerusalem. So he brought not only the news of how Jerusalem was, how Jerusalem was in a sorry state, but he also followed Nehemiah back to Jerusalem thereafter to rebuild the walls together with, Jeru- to, together with Nehemiah. And so Hanani was surely a man who was burdened was also a godly person. But we now also read of another man who Nehemiah puts in charge. We read that Hananiah was the commander of the citadel. A commander. So he was a military man. Uh, And that makes sense, right? For Nehemiah to put a military man in charge. But Nehemiah does not state that that was the main reason why he put Hananiah in charge. The main reason why Nehemiah puts Hananiah in charge, he wrote, was because Hananiah was a man of integrity and feared God. Nehemiah saw the need to put in charge not just people with the right skill sets or the right talents, but those who were godly, those who lived with integrity and feared God. Integrity is one of our higher values. Honour, integrity, generosity, humility, excellence, and rest. Integrity. Integrity is a person who demonstrates a coherence in a way in which he thinks, he walks, and he talks. He walks truthfully before God and men. And one who fears God is one who obeys and trusts in God. He's always mindful in how he follows God's law, in how he follows the ways of God. Nehemiah was convicted that the people he puts in charge to build the community must be people who are godly, people of integrity and fears God. You know, that's what we try to do as a church community as well here in TPMC. We just had our last local conference last Tuesday where we elected our church leaders for the new conference year. And next week, we will be dedicating them at our LCC dedication service. These leaders who were elected were not chosen at random, were not chosen just because they had certain skill sets. There is a nominations committee consisting of our pastors, our lay leader, uh, and nine other members who were either previously leaders of the church or some current leaders or godly church members who represent different segments of our church demographic. And it is this nominations committee who then considers whether our current set of leaders will continue uh, or look for godly potential leaders who can come up and to be brought into the LCEC. We look for people who exhibit the higher values in their lives and in their ministry and how they relate to people, people who have demonstrated a fear of the Lord in their lives. These people are then put up for nomination and then then for election at the last local conference. And the last local conference is chaired by our DS, our district superintendent, Pastor Ruben, who will also be our guest speaker next 
week at our services. And so we as a church do try to put leaders of integrity and fear God to oversee the various ministries of the church, just as Nehemiah was convicted to put godly people in charge. What about you? In the way you lead, perhaps your family, in the way you lead others, perhaps at work or in your ministries, do you strive to be one of integrity, one who truly fears the Lord, so that it is out of your relationship with God and how you fear God that the kind of character flows out of you in the way you lead others. Nehemiah was convicted to put godly people in charge. But there was a third conviction that Nehemiah had. Not only was Nehemiah convicted of their relationship with God being the first priority, not only was Nehemiah convicted of the need to put godly people in charge, Nehemiah was also convicted to follow God's law. It would be God's law that would guide his actions and his decisions. It would be God's law that he would follow in a way he established the norms of their lives as a community. We had read in verse 5 of something that God had put into the heart of Nehemiah. We read, So my God put into my heart to assemble the nobles, the officials, and the common people for registration by families. I found the genealogical record of those who had been the first to return. You see, in the first part of verse 5, what the Lord had put into Nehemiah's heart was to take down records of all the families who were with him in Jerusalem at that time, from the nobles down to the common people. Every family, all who were in Jerusalem, registered them and record them by name. In the second part of the verse, we read that Nehemiah had found the genealogical record of those who had first returned. These were records of those who had returned together with Zerubbabel. Remember that those who came back with Nehemiah were the third wave of returnees from Persia. And the first wave that you see in the arrow here, the first wave had come back earlier, around 60 to 70 years ago with Zerubbabel. And then subsequently, the second wave came back with Ezra, probably about 10 years before Nehemiah. And so Nehemiah's uh, uh, returnees were the third wave. So Nehemiah had found the genealogical records of those who had first come back with Zerubbabel about 60 to 70 years ago. The rest of the chapter, from verse 6 onwards, which we did not read, consists of the names of the heads of all these families who had come back a long time ago. The number of the men uh, in those families and so forth and so forth. And then in verses 39, 43, and 46, we read of the names of the priests, of the Levites, and of the temple servants from this first wave who were also listed. So there were records of who were the priests, who were the Levites, and who were the temple servants. And then we read in verses 64 to 65, two simple, matter-of-fact verses but verses that also crucially showed Nehemiah's conviction. We read that these sought their registration among those enrolled in the genealogies, but it was not found there. So they were excluded from the priesthood as unclean, and the governor told them they were not to partake of the most holy food until a priest with Urim and Thummim should arise. In verse 64, we read that among those who were with Nehemiah at that point in time, who had registered themselves, consisting of the families who had returned, who had returned, amongst those were those who had sought to find their lineage or their genealogy amongst the records of those who had first returned with Zerubbabel, amongst the names who were priests, Levites, and temple servants but they could not find their lineage tracing back to the priests or tracing back to the, to the Levites or, or tracing back to the temple servants. 
And these were presumably those who were already serving as priests at that point in time. And they could not find that their lineage had been linked back to the priests, the Levites, or the temple servants. Because you see, according to the Mosaic law, for example, in Numbers 18, verses 22 to 23, it says, From now on, the Israelites must not go near the tent of the meeting, or they will bear the consequences of their sin and will die. It is the Levites, the Levites who are to do the work of the tent of meeting and bear the responsibility of any offences they commit against it. And this is a lasting ordinance for generations to come. So only the Levites can serve in the tent of meeting and later on serve in the temple. And also only those in the lineage of Aaron can serve as priests from other parts of the law. So according to God's law, if you cannot trace your lineage back to the house of the Levites or the house of Aaron, then you cannot be a priest. This shows the importance of the list of genealogies in the Bible and the importance of keeping good records. This would please our church archivist, Kirk Siang, because he can always remind our LCC of the importance of archives from the example of Nehemiah here. And so based on the records and in following God's law, those who cannot trace their lineage to either the priests or the Levites or the temple servants in the genealogical records, they cannot serve as priests. And Nehemiah decided that they should be excluded from the priesthood. That there will be no compromising of the law of God. It was important for them to follow God's law. Nehemiah was convicted that for them to live rightly as God's people, they had to be people who followed God's law. So, how can we follow Nehemiah's conviction of needing to follow God's law for our own lives? Firstly, it should be quite obvious that in order for us to be able to follow God's law, we need to know what God's law is, what God's word is. Coming to church every Sunday to hear God's word being preached and expounded is a good start, but it is not enough. Reading God's word, reading God's word daily is important. It is reading God's word daily that we not only get God's word into our hearts, but we not, it is in reading God's word daily that we not only get into God's word, but allow God's word to get into us, to get into our hearts. So we need to read God's word daily. Secondly, after allowing God's word to get into us a bit more, we must resolve then to walk in God's word, to follow God's word. It is not always easy, and sometimes it takes courage for us to do so. Surely it is not easy for Nehemiah to tell those who were already practicing as priests that they cannot now be priests, right? For them to step down as priests. It was not easy for him to tell them to do so. It took courage for him to do so. But to follow God's law, he was courageous, and he did so. And so it is for us as well. Sometimes it will take courage to do what is right according to God's word. But if we are to be God's people who will follow God's word, it is important for us to be courageous to do so. And that is the story of Datuk Edward Ong. Datuk Edward's uh, or Datuk Ong's uh, family uh, had already built, they were from a building construction company, and his family had already built projects like the Singapore General Hospital, a few uh, MRT stations, Orchard being one of those. And so he came from a family of construction people. But convicted by God to give up everything to make a difference in the people in Kota Kinabalu, Sabah, he decided to give up all they had here, uproot himself, and go to Sabah, Kota Kinabalu, to build the iconic Sutra Harbour Resort. 
the building project was filled with problems, both financial and political, but he persevered on. And he said, despite the initial difficulties, and in, in the report in Salt and Light, it was written that despite initial difficulties, Dato Ong was resolute in obeying God and the principles laid down in his word. Dato Ong said, I said no, I refuse to pay the bribes. And of course, we had many challenges. He also said, for me, when God closes the door, just trust him. If God closes the door on corruption and you pay to open the door, you will get more trouble. Do you need to bribe God for a blessing? And then he also says, the word of God says that if you meditate on his word and believe in the principles, then you will have success and prosper. And because Dato Ong lived righteously by godly convictions, he had a testimony to share to all those who were working for him. When the Sutra Harbour was finally built, he said he became like a father to 1,800 employees. It was, like, it was the biggest uh, employer other than the Sabah government at that point in time. And he said that because he had lived righteously, people saw how he lived, the employees would come to him and share their family problems with him and ask him to pray for them. Because he lived with godly convictions, he became a father to 1,800 people. Dato Edward Ong was a man who lived by godly convictions. And so too was Nehemiah. Nehemiah had some godly convictions that enabled him to rebuild the community according to God's will. He was convicted that, a relationship, that their relationship with God was of first priority. He was convicted to put the people who, to put godly people of integrity and who feared God in charge, and he was convicted to follow God's law. Church, what might God be convicting you of today? Which of Nehemiah's convictions has God placed upon your heart today? How would you today be a servant who would also live by godly convictions. Let us pray. As we come to the Lord today, perhaps the Lord had tucked at the strings of some of our hearts because we know that we have not been living by godly convictions. And we want to take some time now for the Holy Spirit to come amongst us to speak a personal word to each of us. So as the musicians play for a while, let's quieten our hearts and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Father in heaven, our desire is to be a people who will live by godly convictions. We desire, Lord, to put you first above all else, to put our relationship with you, Lord, as first priority. Help us, O Lord, each day. Help us, O Lord, in the times in which we make decisions 
moment by moment, day by day. Help us, Lord, to always be mindful of how we put you first above all else. But Lord, we also want to be a people of integrity and who would fear the Lord. Empower us, O Lord, we pray. So that, Lord, as we desire to walk in fear of the Lord, Lord, we may be given wisdom to know how to do so in a world that is broken, in a world that is full of temptations, in a world that seeks to tear us away from how we can live in fear of you. Holy Spirit, empower us, we pray. For our desire is also to follow your law, to walk according to your word. So Lord, help us to get your word more and more into our lives. To have the discipline on a daily basis to read your word. So that Lord, knowing your word, we may live according to it. So Lord, help us as your people, O oh Lord, to live by godly convictions so that we may always be able to live according to your will. We thank you, O oh Lord, for your Holy Spirit's empowerment to be able to do so. In Jesus' name, and all God's people say, Amen. Amen.